Friends, good afternoon. My name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to this hour of worship on this Good Friday as we uh, continue to make our way in this Lenten journey now in this hour to the very foot of the cross. I want to welcome all those who are worshiping with us here in person. I also want to welcome all of you who are worshiping online. Uh, it's not lost on me that the world continues to turn at this 12 o'clock hour on uh, this Friday, March 29th. People are at work. Uh, people are tending to responsibilities. Uh, a baseball game is going to be played this afternoon. March Madness continues. The world continues to spin. But we as Christians uh, mark this time, and I want to thank you for marking this time, those who are online and those who are here in the sanctuary, for this very sacred hour, an important hour, for Easter makes no sense unless we mark this day. The promise of the resurrection, the hope that we carry in our hearts makes no sense unless we take the time to acknowledge the despair and treachery of Jesus' final hours and his death on a cross. So again, I want to say thank you genuinely for marking this time that we're allowed and have the opportunity to mark this time together as the body of Christ. Before I pray, I want to uh, give a heartfelt welcome to my father-in-law, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Miller, who's no stranger to First Presbyterian Church. Uh, he's preached here. He is the pastor emeritus of the First Presbyterian Church of Moorestown, New Jersey, a suburb just outside of uh, Philadelphia. He served that congregation for 23 years. I actually met uh, Jonathan in the spring of 1998. Uh, before I met Katie, uh, I was just thinking about this as we were preparing for worship. He offered me an internship, and I turned him down. Which was a good thing, because what I did take opened the door for me to meet Katie. So you've forgiven me for that. Uh, but we're grateful that Jonathan has prepared a word for us today on this solemn and sacred day. Jonathan, thank you for being with us in worship. Friends, let us now prepare our hearts in a moment of prayer. Lord, we faintly hear the traffic on Peachtree, the construction on 16th Street, pedestrians walking up and down this most important thoroughfare in our city, We can hear even the noise that we bring into this time of worship, the inner voice, the checklists, the responsibilities, the people we miss, the grief, all that is in front of us. And we'd ask, O oh Lord, in some mysterious way, by a measure of your spirit, a measure of your grace, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive the message of this Good Friday. Why it is that we have the audacity to say that this day is good, even in the face of so much suffering and death. So we come to you now asking you by the power of your spirit to clean the table for us so that we may be fully prepared to receive you and the news of this day so we can be fully prepared in just a few days to receive the good news of an empty tomb and a right relationship with you. But now, O oh Lord, bring us into this moment as we join our voices together in our responsive 
call to worship. Friends, blessed be the name of the Lord our God who redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us stand in body or in spirit and worship the crucified God. we share together in the litany for Good Friday. Our Savior now enters the valley of the shadow of death 
where evil waits in savage glee. God, hold Jesus in your arms, even as his arms stretch wide on a cross, embrace us. Our Savior submits now to the worst that all the powers of earth and hell can array against him. God, hold Jesus in your arms, even as his arms stretch wide on the cross, embrace us. Our Savior suffers by human wiles twisted in torture, yet intercedes on behalf of the good of all. God, hold Jesus in your arms, even as his arms stretch wide on a cross, embrace us. Though we stand at a distance, we pray with our Lord. God, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all in the world who know the trauma of death's ever-stalking presence and destruction's delight in feeding upon our fear. God, God have, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, Lord, have mercy. We pray for all who scoff at this cross because they have been wounded by it or because they do not understand. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. mercy. Lord, Lord, have mercy. We pray for ourselves who choose to stand at a distance, afraid to enter into the full mystery of your redemptive power. God, God have mercy. mercy. Christ, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have, have mercy. In this trembling hour of terror, O God, grant us faith that we may continue to trust in your presence, even when defeat and despair triumph. In this hour of dread, grant us hope that we may continue to trust in your presence, even when defeat and despair triumph. Through your grace, help us to believe that, that your faithfulness will triumph even when our faith flees and darkness rules the day. This we ask through Christ, your Son, our brother and Lord. Amen. Amen.
Hear God's word for you and for me from the Gospel of John, chapters 18 and 19. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And again, he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. And the woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I have said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. 
So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. And the Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to them to be crucified. 
So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things... Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to, take, to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. And now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, 
and the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Friends, please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, our hope and strength, we give thanks for your word made flesh, for the life that death cannot destroy, and for the light that darkness cannot overcome. Enlighten our minds, enliven our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we may testify to your light. Share the light of Christ Christ with the hurting world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I have three observations to share with you this morning about the reading we have just heard. The first has to do with the leaning into the cross that we're invited to participate in, the fact that the cross in fact saves and the reminder that the cross really is everything as we understand freedom to new life. Leaning into the cross. 52 years ago, I was in a restaurant. In that restaurant, I knew I had a task to perform. I was as nervous as I could be. We finished our dinner together. I reached into my pocket and took out the little box I gave it to the most beautiful woman in the world. She opened it, and as she opened it, I said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. I don't know if she said it quickly or if she took a little bit of time, but she said, yes. And so I was in the military at the time, and we were trying to figure out how can we get married together and the family and everything, and so I called my father, a Baptist minister, and I said, Dad, Karen and I are going to get married, and we're trying to set a date. We'd like to do it this weekend, in fact, on this Friday. And my dad said, well, John, that's Good Friday. I said, well, it really is a Good Friday. We're getting married. We could have a wonderful celebration. I say this because in my background, I've never really experienced the sweep of the lectionary, the the wonder of the Christian calendar, what Lent is about or what a Good Friday, we didn't do that at the time. I've received many wonderful gifts from the the Baptist tradition, but there was a, a blind side to my whole life in that regard. Now, let me contrast that with this picture. She's 100 years old. She moved to a retirement community not long ago, maybe three months ago. She was a longtime member of the Merchantville Presbyterian Church. I went to see her, and as we were talking, I said, you know, this Lenten season, is there anything I can bring back to the office that would be helpful? Say, can I communicate something back? She said, oh, no, no, no. I said, what is meaningful to you about this Lenten season? And Kay Smolsky looked me in the eyes, and when I asked the question, the tears were beginning to form. And I didn't know if I said the wrong thing. What is the most, what is the one, what do I think of, what do you think of during this Lenten season? And she said, oh, it's easy. It's easy. The cross. I still am un- I still can't understand how Jesus could take all of my sin, my doubt, my anger, my confusion, take that upon himself. Leaning into the cross. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises, we are healed. 
I'm so grateful for the invitation to be here, Tony and Katie and pastor friends, because it's required that I, again, focus on the Passion Scripture, the whole matter of the cross. And I am richer for having been through that. I am so grateful for people like Kay Smolsky, who reminds me. Dr. Holmes gave a superb message yesterday, Monday service time in the chapel. And I happened to be sitting right in front of the cross. And it's a red cross, not really red, but it's reddish. It looked to me like it was stained, like it was blood stained. To me, that's what I'm trying to say, to lean into the cross, what's behind the meaning behind all of this. The second point I wanted to make is that the cross actually saves us. From Isaiah, from Hebrews chapter 10, where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is his hair. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, we have confidence to enter the sanctuary because he saves. He saves us. As you and I enter the sanctuary, I think there's always a saving opportunity of some sort that comes to the front if we're paying attention and listening and allowing that spirit to be at work. But the cross saves. David Williams is an Englishman. <clears throat> He's from the Forest of Dean in Gloucester. He was a tail gunner of a Royal Bomber in World War II. He flew 40 different flights. The 41st flight the anti-aircraft bullets ripped through his plane. The belly was badly damaged. And after they were hit, they were trying to maintain, stabilize the plane, but it was difficult. And finally, the pilot said, to ensure our lives, we all must bail out. All of us must bail out. Well, David Williams was the tail gunner and the twisted metal was such that he couldn't move. He tried in every way to free himself. He couldn't move. And finally, he cried out to the captain, Captain, I'm sorry, I can't get out. There was a, a pause, and then the captain said, well, well, in that case, we'll take it in. And he tried as best he could to stabilize that plane, but. It hit the ground hard. The captain was killed. He lost his life, but David Williams has lived. Lived to tell stories of God's grace in his own life. You and I are saved by the cross. It's what Jesus Christ has done upon a cross that takes us out of the brokenness of our lives, the, the battered places, like in that bomber, that hold us and can confuse us. Lean into the cross. The cross does save. Finally, the cross is everything. From John chapter 18, <clears throat> Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. There's a greater good, there's a greater purpose, there's a greater reality, there's a, a greater place in which you and I will someday come face to face with the one who died upon a cross for us. I was with my doctor on Monday, and she said, well, you're preaching in Atlanta on Good Friday, well, what are you gonna preach about? And I said, well, I'm going to say that the cross is everything. It makes the difference between life and life abundant. John Evans, 
buried his sister a few years ago now. John was 88 years old. John had osteoporosis, and so he was bent over, had a very short cane, had hearing aids. We were at the cemetery for the interment. I didn't think he heard a word that I said. And as he finished, he said, Mr. Miller, could I say just a few words before we go? And I said, of course you can. And so he began. He said, I'm 88 years old, but I feel like I'm 10 years old. Let me tell you what I mean. When I was 78 years old, my very best friend asked me, have you read the Gospel of John? And I said, no, I have not read the Gospel of John. He said, I'd like to encourage you to read the Gospel of John. I said, you know, I don't need the Bible. I don't need the church. I don't need any of that. But because he was my best friend, I read the Gospel of John. And you know what happened? He's saying this. He's projecting loud because of all the hearing problems. You know what happened? I fell in love with Jesus. He has become everything to me. And so I began to wonder, well, I'm a, what can I do to, to share the hope, the life that I've received in these 10 years since reading the gospel? How can I communicate? He said, I'm a union carpenter. And so I'm going to create signs of hope and I'll give them to anyone who wants one. Signs of hope. And he pulled out of his back pocket this handmade cross. He called it a sign of hope. He said, would you like one? I said, I certainly would. And then from that day on, every month, I'd get a supply of 25 new signs of hope until the day he died, every month. And I really needed them all. We had a tragic death of a high school student, and all 500 that he prepared for us, all, we put them on the communion table, all 500 were gone as the service ended. Lean into the cross. The cross does save. The cross really is everything, as John Evans suggests. Lord, thank you for the privilege of coming under the cross, coming near the cross. Thank you for the privilege of being at this, uh, with this great congregation. I pray for its leadership, your blessing upon each one in the congregation. I thank you especially for those who've made it a choice to be here on this holy day. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.
Will you join with us in our solemn approaches of the cross? It's printed in your bulletin. O my people, O my church, what have I done to you, or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy, holy and mighty, mighty, holy, holy mortal, mortal one, have, have mercy on us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you my chosen and fairest vineyard I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, Holy God. God. Holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy, God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have, have mercy upon us. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, Holy God. God. Holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, one, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy, holy God, God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, one have, have mercy upon us. us.
Friends, continue to lean into the cross. Know that the cross saves. In fact, the cross is everything. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.